Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast, a weekly deep dive into the stories that transformed our guests into leaders worth following. I'm your host, Joe Boyd. If you've been enjoying the podcast, thank you so much for being a listener. One simple thing you can do to help us out is give a review wherever you listen. Today's guest is best-selling author David Berkus. He has seen Robin Hood, Prince and Thieves over 200 times, but you should still listen to the podcast anyway. I learned a ton from this conversation that I'm going to put into practice, including how to do an open door policy virtually. Also learned what it means to pick a fight in a good way. And he calls something that all of us have every day our ugly babies. You're going to want to learn what that is. David Burkus, welcome to the LeaderCast podcast. Super excited to have you today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Where, where are you from? Where, where am I talking to you? Well, I'm Philly by birth. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tulsa, Oklahoma by choice, right? Gotcha. So uh, it's, especially as it pertains to football, by the way, this year was quite crushing, right? Because <laughs> OU was yeah. terrible and Philly got my hopes up and then let me down in the very, in the, in the Super Bowl. But, but, oh, well. Well, uh, I'm a Bengals fan, so we don't want to talk about football season this year. Yeah, so, let's so, just let's just move on. Let's just, let's move, just on. move on. Collect. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, super excited to get to know you a little better. Uh, we were introduced to our mutual friend Todd Henry, and generally, uh, that's a good sign anytime Todd uh, says I should know someone. Uh, but I, I do want to, uh, at some point, go back and just hear your story. But for now, for the folks who aren't aware, uh, uh, what what are you into these days? I know you're an author and a consultant, but tell us a little bit about your practice and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a, an organizational psychologist by training and a, a writer by passion. So I was a full-time business school professor here in Tulsa for about 10 years. Um, started writing practitioner-focused books. Like I, I had this realization that you work really, really hard and spend like 18 to 24 months of your life to get one 15-page article published in an academic journal and then seven people read it. And somehow that's supposed to make your career. Yeah. didn't sound all that appealing <laughs> to me. Uh, so I started writing for practitioner audiences, both uh, books, but also like in Harvard Business Review and Forbes and that sort of stuff. Um, and then I found that was more fun. Like, it's a lot of fun. The, the joke that I use a lot of times is I'm trying to get good ideas out of the ivory tower and into the corner office or the co-working space or wherever people are actually working. Yeah. Um, and I found it's it's really quite fun to be that helpful to people, right? To provide these insights that we know are, are true. They're, they're evidence-based. They're, you know, research-oriented uh, but to provide them to practitioners as opposed to just continue the conversation with other academics. I love it. Uh, the academic world is its own uh, little like sub colony of people. I found out from my folks <laughs> that are professors. It's, it's, it's a world you, uh, you either thrive in or you don't, I think. Right. For a lot of people. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, there's more and more of them escaping, you know, <laughs> in about probably 2000 or, or 2005. I don't exactly remember when like Gladwell wrote his first book, right. Yeah. Which was, really one of the better examples of science writing uh, done by an outsider. But that then kicked off a wave of a lot of academics going, well, wait a minute, I should write about my own research. And so we've got more and more escaping every single day, but there's still a sort of very insular yeah. uh, group of people who are interested in conducting research and sharing that research with other academics. And that's where I kind of disagree. I'm like, well, if it's true and it's helpful, let's get it out there as quickly as possible. Right. Yep. Awesome. Okay, let's let's go back. Uh, I love. I'm a story nerd. Uh, I I, uh, I love like Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, and I've been a storyteller my whole life. Had a, a weird meandering career, but the story's always been a part of it. Um, so for the podcast, I just like to kind of frame your story around that kind of journey. So could you take me back to when you were a kid? Where where were you? What were you doing? What we, what are your sort of earliest passions and memories as a kid? Yeah, so this is where it actually gets a little weird, right? Because I said I'm a I'm a psychologist by training, but a writer by passion. And that actually goes all the way back. Like I remember when I was probably seven or eight years old, my dad worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, one of the early computing companies. They were mainframe computers, started getting into home computers. And I don't know, I feel like everybody of a certain age has that memory of the first computer brought home, like, yeah. like this new appliance. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure older generations, maybe they remember like the first refrigerator or first dishwasher, but for a lot of us, it's the first computer. I'm microwave brought home. age, just so you know, I couldn't remember. Ah, first microwave. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so for me, it was that right. And it was, it was a DOS computer, right? It wasn't windows. It was yeah. a digital green, black terminal, green letters, et cetera. Um, but it's funny. Cause I remember something in me thought about being a writer at that point. I, plagiarized an entire book when I was like seven years old. I loved the book and I was like, I want to write a book. So I typed the entire thing on that computer and then just changed the name on the title page, printed it out and was like, I wrote a book. 
Um, and not very smart at seven years old. But again, it was that I later learned that what was it? Hunter S. Thompson uh, retyped the entirety of The Great Gatsby uh, to get an idea of what a good classic novel felt like. Right, That's an old apocryphal tale. So yeah. maybe that was my version of what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and the only stuff I have from like my high school life uh, is I was that literary magazine nerd. I was the school newspaper nerd, all of that sort of stuff. I, I was the one that had this amazing revelation that you could use a saddle stapler to bind a bunch of papers as if it were a book and so we started publishing books in high school nice. right so it was sort of always in that in that realm yeah um studying org psych etc was kind of a detour uh, becoming an academic was kind of a detour now seven-year-old me even 18-year-old me probably wouldn't have known i would end up writing business books that yeah. blend psychology and and case studies but seven-year-old me knew i would end up telling stories and that's effectively what i do I love it. So one of my favorite questions to ask, I think you'll be a great person for it, is those, what's those, what was the early adventure story that sort of captivated your heart? Was there a, uh, was a movie or a comic book or, any, or a book that you read uh, that you're like, I want to live in that world? Oh, dude, I was so into Indiana Jones yeah. uh, and, and uh, Batman was favorite super. I actually just off camera over here. I have a, like a painting of Batman, half Batman, half Bruce Wayne. It's nice. a, it's an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, I the, <laughs> probably watched Kevin Costner's Robin Hood 240 times to this day. I could probably recite every line in that movie. <laughs> like if you put it on and press pause, I could probably tell you what the next line is in that movie, just in the memory banks. But um, but I also sort of played around with stories like I was the kid on the playground growing up that found a way to weave in like Star Wars at Sherwood Forest with Indiana Jones in order to create enough characters for everybody to be able to play. Right. Nice. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't just sort of that story, that one story that captivated me, but playing around with lots of different stories. And what would it look like if these things weave together and we're in the same universe, um, which looking back sounds really, really nerdy, uh, but I think it helped a little bit. It's all right. Uh, nerds usually end up okay in the end. That's what I found. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's dude, look, dude. That's quite, that's quite true. That's yeah. quite true. I have a I have an eleven year old and a nine year old, both boys, and we kind of talk about it all the time. Is there something about being a, a a boy dad where you want them to be like the the jock, the the right. captain of the football team? But in reality, you're like actually the best thing for them would be to do chess, right? Right. <laughs> um, I am intrigued by Batman, though. Not I've, no one's told me they got a Batman painting on their wall, so. Uh, talk about your fascination with, with that or what, what that painting is all about. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can hang on. Yeah. Turn it. Yeah. There you go. Show and tell. Yeah. If you're listening to the audio, you need to go check out the YouTube channel, but this is what's on my, uh, okay. what's on my wall, this sort of dual identity idea. I don't know. You know, for me, it was like, um, I came of age in the era of, uh, the WB and the Disney afternoon, lots of superhero stories. Yeah. Uh, when you come home from school and you're ready to watch cartoons, uh, new adventures of Superman and Batman, et cetera. And what I always liked about Batman, probably the same as Indiana Jones and the other, he was human, right? Like Superman is basically invincible except for kryptonite. Batman, totally mortal, right? Just a person with a, a really big sense of responsibility um, and really cool martial arts skills. I'm sure that helped. Yeah. And some money. Uh, the eight year old me love him. Right. But it was, <laughs> it was that idea that like, this person's not a superhero. There's just a weight of, of duty, a weight of calling on them. Uh, and they rose to it. I think I always loved that. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Maybe we'll come back to that later, but let's, let's, uh, I have some questions about the duality part. Um, as we move forward, uh, when did, uh, I know you said you were into writing, but what were those early career ambitions when you started thinking about that? Maybe high school or maybe in college or after when, when you started thinking about what you wanted to do to make a living? Yeah. I mean, so I, I went to uh, college. I went to four-year university first for English and creative writing. That was my – I have a double major. That was the first major. The second was organizational communication because about third year uh, – I think, I think second semester, third year was when we did long-form journal, narrative journalism and science writing – and that was when I found sort of early Gladwell New Yorker pieces and that sort of thing. It was yeah. just like, this is fascinating because this is using every element of storytelling I learned in the fiction classes. Mm -hmm. And yet this actually happened and it's equally compelling and it's useful because you can draw conclusions uh, on your own life. And then, and then, uh, you know, a, a number of months later, I figured out these people aren't actually starving compared to novelists. So that's <laughs> yeah. a plus, yeah. right? So maybe this is what I want to do with my life. Now, that wasn't what I did right away. I um, 
I also, when I was in college, I met a girl who wanted to get married and also wanted to go to medical school. Uh, we're still married, but medical school, I thought, okay, this is going to be sort of interesting. So I need to pay the bills for a decent enough amount of time. Yeah. So I took a job actually in pharmaceuticals. I was in sales and marketing for a pharmaceutical company for a while while doing grad degrees part-time. Um, fast forward to 2009, Affordable Care Act passed. Say what you will about that. I'm not really interested in getting in any kind of political discussion, but it changed the world of pharmaceutical marketing. Yep. That's for sure. Yep. And, and I thought, I need a lifeboat. And at the time, the only thing I was qualified to do outside of that was to, to work in academia because I had a master's degree and half of a doctorate at that point. So that was my lifeboat from it. Totally unintentional. Yeah. Totally unintentional. Um, I thought I was going to work in the pharma industry for 20, 25 years, retire, figure out this writer thing. Uh, but uh, it ended up being a way better plan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite glad for it. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't strike me as you're the sort of person that had like really crystal clear, I want to be this when I grow up kind of ambition or, or not. Yeah, I mean, again, writing and telling stories was somewhere in there yeah. all the time. Yeah. But I think most people don't have crystal clear ambition, yeah. right? Yeah. Like yeah. my wife, who finished medical school and is now a doctor, is really lucky because when you're seven years old and you say you want to be a doctor, like you just picked one of the 12 careers seven-year-olds know about, right? right. Like fundamentally. Like fireman, seven policeman, year old right? <laughs> right, fireman, right. policeman, teacher, doctor, right? right. That, that's it. And yeah. so it's great if you can be one of those things, but but – there's so many other things you can do with your life that you're totally unaware of. Yeah. Um, and now we live in a world where every five or 10 years, the the options completely turn over and there's all sorts of new options for yeah. what you want to do with your yeah. life. So, yeah. So I would probably put myself more in that group. I, writing, telling stories was probably going to be part of it in some capacity, but no idea that it would end up taking the shape that it did. And that's fine because I had no idea. I mean, even when I was 18 years old entering into a creative writing program, I didn't know nonfiction outside of textbooks existed. Yeah. Nobody, no, no 18 year old reads nonfiction books. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Very few, I would think. Um, no, I, I mean, I went to, I went to seminary and became a pastor and, uh, thought that's what I was going to do forever. And before I knew it, I was, uh, doing improv with the second city in Las Vegas for my job. So it, it, yeah, it makes things total sense. pretty fast, Fucking right? Yeah. <laughs> very, very clear path between yeah, exactly. those two. Things. Now I do this, but it all worked out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think, I do think though sometimes in like leadership circles the we can elevate the the very sort of driven you know like a Mark Zuckerberg or someone who who just at 19 they knew they were going to do this and they wrote it they wrote a check for a billion dollars to themselves and all all those yeah. kind of stories but most of us are not like that that's not how most leaders form we we sort of improvise our way through in many ways yeah, no, I agree. And, and there's a huge survivorship bias to that, right? So survivorship yeah. bias, a concept in statistics where we basically overweight the success stories because we never hear about the failures, right? Yeah. And and so we hear about the story of Mark Zuckerberg writing about how many computer science majors at Harvard around the exact same time went to work for Oracle and climbed the ranks to middle management and then flamed out there. Yeah, yeah. Right. We don't know. We have no idea. So we don't tell those stories, yeah. right? This is where... This is where the writer part of me blends with the organizational psychologist part of me because yeah. I know the research side and statistics and what have you, and I'm sort of always aware of that, right? Um, so they're great stories, but it's only when we compare and contrast those, right? How many times did somebody have a clear-cut thing they wanted to do and it all fell apart compared to a Zuckerberg? Yeah. And what was the difference? Why did it work for Zuckerberg but not work for this person? Yeah. Those are stories I'm interested in. And then probably somebody should ask, is Zuckerberg happy? At some well, point, yeah, yeah. Him, <laughs> sometimes we, we actually elevate stories that I'm not, I don't know him. He might be, but like there's, we tend to, uh, assume that success is, is the ultimate sort of meaning, you know, or we tend to assume one aspect of somebody's success yeah, yeah, is yeah. the ultimate. Like my, my buddy, Ryan Holiday always talks about being jealous of other people. And his little trick is like, if you're jealous of something, somebody has stop and ask yourself, would you trade your whole life? for their whole life? Yeah. And the answer is probably not. You might be jealous of that one little thing, but what fell apart in their life in order to get that one little thing, you probably don't want to fall apart in your life. I think of that. I'm a, I'm a addicted entrepreneur. Like I, I, I'm at an age where I want to stop and I can't, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just always like to be my own boss and like to start things. Uh, and, uh, and I get jealous of folks that just go home at five o'clock. But 
<laughs> but but I know that I don't that I you know I, I wouldn't really want to trade. But that, that's a good thing to think about. Yeah. Uh, okay. So take us. Uh, so how'd you get from where where you uh, where you were to to what you do now? Uh, consulting sort of business leaders, writing the books. What what happened in your life to take that that turn that you talked about? Yeah, so I, I, I took the leap in 2013 and published a book for practitioners instead of for other academics. Mm-hmm. Um, and it did okay in the market, led to some interesting uh, invitations to speak and, and work with organizations. And, and so that was kind of fun. It was always sort of a side hustle compared to the academic career uh, until about 2016. So 2016, I wrote a book called Under New Management, which was sort of a future of work book. Here's all these different trends that are happening in the workplace. Um, including a chapter about how, isn't it crazy? Here's these weird companies you've never heard of, but they have 1,200 employees and zero offices. They all work entirely remotely. Yeah. Like, no idea that was coming down the road four right. years from now. Um, but that that book had a modicum of success that kept me really, really busy. And the combination of like teaching a class, getting done with a class at, at six o'clock in the evening, driving to the airport, flying somewhere, speaking or running a workshop Tuesday morning, flying home, taking the red eye, driving straight to campus and teaching a Monday morning class. I was like, I got to stop. I mean, I had, I had days where I would, I'm sure you'd be being the serial entrepreneur. You are, I'm sure you've had these days too. I had days where I was flying to other cities, like flying from Chicago to DFW, just to stay in the DFW airport so that I could take the 6am flight from DFW to Vancouver, just to be in Vancouver two hours earlier. Yeah, yeah. And it's just sort of ridiculous. Yeah. Right. So around 2016, we started scaling down how much teaching I was doing. Grateful to, I I taught at Oral Roberts University here in Tulsa, grateful to them for kind of scaling that down. They're primarily a teaching institution and occasionally a basketball school. Um, We won't talk about this appearance in the NCAA though. Um, And so they started scaling that down right up up until sort of COVID. And then there was that chapter in 2016 about uh, remote work. We took that chapter in response to COVID and the work from home the grand work from home experiment, as I call it, and flush that out into a whole kind of manual book for for people. And then that was probably, that wasn't even my idea, to be honest with you, that was my editor's idea. Fun. I'll tell you a a different fun story about that editor because he rejected my previous idea and then he came to me with this idea. And um, we flushed it out and that got me so busy that I was like, I can't can't continue to teach. So now that's uh, predominantly what I do is, is work with organizations on I I my sweet spot right now because I think this is where we are in the world of remote work is that I focus it on team culture not organizational culture because if the pandemic taught us anything it's that the team of people you're working on the people you're signing into zoom and seeing every day the people you're training with emails every day the culture of how that team operates matters way more than company perks or company culture or any stuff like that yeah right and whether you're returning to the office or not and you're returning to a hybrid or you're staying remote etc we need to have that conversation so since uh, late 2020, that's been 100% of my work. And again, 17-year-old me had no idea that yeah. that would be what we would be working on, but it's a total blast. And uh, and I'm really quite glad to be able to do it. Well, I want to get, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I think we we have people ask about the most is sort of how is leadership changing in a in a really a hybrid environment now, right? Um, and uh, what's the name of that book, first of all? The, so that book's called Leading from Anywhere. Okay. Um, that was anywhere. my big, I lost, but that was my big bet was that we wouldn't call it work from home versus work from the office. We would just call it work from anywhere and therefore yeah. leaders needed to lead from anywhere. Somehow we settled on hybrid instead, yeah. uh, but oh well. Um, but so, I mean, lay it on me. What 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 are the things you're telling people about this that that's really resonating with folks about leading teams in a remote world? Yeah. So again, that first, the first and, and biggest insight is that we need to pay attention to culture on a team wide level. It's everyone's business now, not just senior leaders, not just HR department, et cetera. If you lead people, the culture of the team, how they interact, the habits of behavior, the norms, all of that is your responsibility. And and by the way, this was probably true before the pandemic, yeah. right? You know, we always joked about people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. Well, why? Because bosses allow a toxic culture on that team. Um, and even before the pandemic, if we asked people, you know, describe to me your company's culture, probably 85% of what they say would actually be what it's like to work on their specific team. So this is probably true before the pandemic, but it came glaringly obvious, right? So that was probably number one. Um, Number two, I I think biggest one is that we still had a lot of managers and and honestly still do. And I think this is what's driving the no excuses, everyone come back trend. We still have a lot of managers and leaders who equate presence with productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, I can see you Therefore, I know you're working. I, I can see it, whether it's 
in person or now whether it's activity. Oh, you send an email at 8.30 a.m. and another one at 7.15 p.m. Oh, you must be a hard worker. Maybe not. Maybe yeah. they went to play pickleball for three hours right. in the middle of the day, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, oh, I'm, here I am. I'm in the office. I swiped in at 8.30. I swipe out at 5.15. You might have been on YouTube for two hours researching random cryptocurrencies yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the day. We don't right. know. Presence right. doesn't equal productivity. So you have to be a leader who leads for results at this point. Very clear expectations, very clear results. Uh, and give your people that level of autonomy to achieve those results because you're not going to be able to track activity anymore. Yeah. Uh, so very personal thing you can maybe help with, me with. We we have a hybrid environment. So we have an office here in Cincinnati with um, about half our team is here. And then the other half is uh, actually different states all around, all around the U.S. Um, I noticed that before when everyone was in an office, I was very much a, a lead by – strolling around kind of guy <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh on purpose just popping in people's office how's it going i'm an improv guy so i like that without setting up a meeting it's always felt informal uh and i i have very much struggled with just starting to see that first of all i, I do that some with the folks here but then i lose touch with the people that aren't here um yeah. and conversations happen that i thought everybody was involved in but then i think back oh no that just happened in my office because somebody walked in um in any advice to folks Folks like me that were so used to, to just sort of, it, it wasn't about productivity for me, it was just presence. I liked presence so we yeah. could interact, you know? Yeah, and, and, and in a 100% in a co-located environment, I think management by walking around Tom Peters' old diatribe yeah. is, is a great philosophy, right? Just get to know your people and walk around. Not like Lumberg level walk around with a coffee cup telling people to put a cover sheet on their TPS right. reports, right? But yeah. um but, but checking in with them, et cetera, works really well. The, the best, I th in my opinion, the best virtual version of that would be, I, I would encourage you to set some office hours. Like let's say every Thursday from two to four, I'm on Zoom, I can't, I'm at my desk, but I'm on Zoom, here's the link. If somebody wants to just drop in and ask me a question from the virtual team, I'm here. Cool, Right. that's a good idea. Not everybody will, but some people will. Yeah. And in fact, what you'll find is that some people will drop in with a question and then linger, and then you'll kind of catch up, right? Okay. And, and then when that happens, reward the fact that it happened. So you have a great conversation with, I'm just going to make up a name, Troy, on your team, right? And it sparks something in you. Send a whole email out to the team. Hey, Troy jumped in on the office hours today. We had this amazing conversation that made me think of this. So that it's a regular reminder you do that on a regular basis, yeah. right? In the past, we might have called that, oh, I have an open door policy, but it's a little more deliberate, right? I have a very structured open door policy, but I'm committed that it's open in these hours. Yeah, it's an open Zoom. <laughs> uh, I love yeah. that. I'll it's office it. hours, ironically enough, right? I'm an academic. Right. It's, it's basically yeah. office hours. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I'll, I'll definitely uh, definitely try that. Uh, as I was getting ready for our conversation, I noticed uh, you have some stuff out there about uh, – we talk about fighting in a couple different ways or arguing. <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, I, I know part of it you talk about is as having a cause to fight for, but also you, you straight up address conflict some. Uh, I yeah. think uh, I, uh, I am not uh, – I, I haven't, I'm conflict avoidant to a point and then I go for it. Um, but I, I think I, I like to surround myself also with people that are conflict avoidant. Um, some of the things <laughs> uh, you learn as you go. Um, I would love some general advice, especially on, uh, uh, say a team merges together or a new, a new member of the team maybe comes in who's a little more uh, comfortable with conflict than the other folks. Um, any, any thoughts just in general about how to, to deal with that? specifically yeah. maybe remotely so and, and when we say conflict here what we're really talking about is task focused sort of productive conflict over ideas right certainly if there's somebody on the team who is engaging in, in interpersonal conflict right. shooting yeah. people down etc yeah. that's a totally different issue we have to deal with but i think there's a tendency among leaders to assume that silence equals consent mm -hmm. right that if nobody's saying anything it's because we all agree and then we can just move forward and it's never true Right. In the scenario that you just described with two teams coming together, silence usually means one of two things. It either means someone disagrees and they haven't figured out how to phrase it yet. Right. So we just need to be comfortable with the pause. Yeah. Right? Or or it means that in, in psychology research, we have this term psychological safety. It means that the new people, especially on the team, don't feel safe enough yet to take that risk. Because speaking up to disagree with somebody is a risk. You don't know how they're going to respond. Yep. You don't know what's going to happen. Submitting your different idea that's different from the rest of the group, but you think is a better idea, that's you're inviting people to judge your new idea. That's a risk. Yeah, We need to kind of raise that level um, of, of psychological safety. And I think we do this in two ways. 
right? The, the first is as a leader to the level that you can signal vulnerability, to the level that you can kind of self-deprecate on some of your own ideas to point out that you are willing to get criticism on them. Yeah. That can help encourage people to, to speak up and disagree with you, right? So that's kind of thing number one, signal vulnerability, signal that awareness that your idea is not perfect, that yeah. everybody's idea, ideas are... Um, T Todd Henry and I used to chat about this all the time. And I honestly don't remember if he came up with it, I came up with it, or we stole it from a third person. But ideas are ugly babies, right? Yeah. You're never supposed to call a baby ugly, <laughs> right? But some babies make beautiful toddlers, right? And a lot of ideas, a, a lot of ideas are like that. They need time to, to develop, but they also need nurturing. And in this case, nurturing is conflict. Nurturing is pushing back and, because pushing back encourages people to think more about the idea, et cetera. But like a baby, we take it very, very personally, right? And so, so we not only need to signal to people that we're willing to let you call our baby ugly in order to make it better, right? But then the other thing we do is teach people those sort of rules of how to fight right, if you will. Yeah. So when you're observing two people on your team who are in conflict, you may want to throw a pause down and, and set the ground rules for discussion. Hey, we're only gonna we're only gonna talk about it this way. I'm I'm a huge fan of of because you were in improv. I'm a huge yep. fan of Pixar's concept of plussing, yep. which is stolen from Yes and and yep. and always accept an offer, which is this idea that criticism is great, but criticism always has to be matched with a plus, a suggestion on how we can get it better. And so if you can set like a ground rule for that, when people on your team are fighting with each other, that they're always plussing, even when they're criticizing, you can kind of flip people's mind that the purpose of this is to make it better, mm -hmm. right? And the, the fun thing is when a team adapts something like plussing to, to fight right, it almost fe it feels uncomfortable when someone doesn't add a plus, yeah. right? When someone, because then we see, oh, that's, that's overtly negative and not helpful, right? Yeah. So it's sort of, it's the unhelpful, unhealthy conflict stands out when we set those ground rules. So those are my two, right? Number one, signal vulnerability. And number two, be the referee, teach the rules, whether it's plusing or something else to get people on your team to know how to fight right as well. I love that. I mean, you, you brought up my love language with yes and. So uh, I, <laughs> I actually have tattoos on my arms to say that. Um, oh, that's awesome. That, uh, and, and I love how uh, sometimes when people use that, they think you just have to say yes to every bad idea. Uh, and, and to me, it's, it's, it's so important, especially at the beginning of a process to, to have an atmosphere where, yes, I hear your idea and let's add to it. Let's build on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 exa exactly. And I, I think, I think in a conflict situation, this is where we stray a little bit from the rules of improv, right? Because like improv, yes, the spirit of yes end is always accept an offer. Yeah. Uh, and I would flip this and say, always extend an offer, mm -hmm. right? It's okay to criticize, but recognize that you're going to shut down the flow of ideas unless you also extend an offer. So always extend an offer as well. Okay. We're running out of time. Unfortunately, I could talk all day. <laughs> I know, but I, I want to, I go got you distracted with improv. I'm sorry. I, well, if you've every podcast here, I've been distracted by improv because I'm, I can't help myself. Um, the, uh, I do want to ask though about the other part of fighting that you talk about, about having a, a cause to fight for. Um, yeah. and, and can you just talk about what that means? What, what you mean when you say that? Yeah. So this is kind of funny too, because I know at one point we had planned to talk about sort of failures, et cetera. And this yeah. is actually my biggest failure too. Uh, so I told you the editor for leading from anywhere who came with me from the idea. Um, and that was great. And it was really kind of a pivotal thing. What you don't know is that that same editor rejected an idea for a book that I had, which was called pick a fight. And the idea here was it's a it's a it's a double entendre, right? Yeah. Pick a fight, but also choose your fight selectively. Ultimately, I, I kind of learned this hack working with teams, where I could sort of shortcut to whether or not they had a clear and compelling purpose by asking them instead of asking why do we do what we do or what's our purpose, et cetera. I would say what are we fighting for? Now, keep in mind, not who are we fighting. That's a question about competitors and rivals, and yeah. that honestly doesn't. That really doesn't jazz up most people. Mm -hmm. What are we fighting for? What injustice in the world are we trying to, to remove or overcome? What, uh, what disruptive innovation are we trying to bring about in the world? What new reality are we fighting to bring about in the world? Mm. Um, and, and if you can answer that question, I think you can keep people a lot more motivated through what in, in research we call um, a superordinate goal, something people see as so big and so important that they have to come together as a team, that they, that they have to work together for it. Otherwise, it'll never kind of and it'll never happen. Yeah. Right? And so I pitched that idea to him and he didn't like it. Yeah. He was like, <laughs> he was like, you know, I don't know. It just it seems like it's not all that developed. It seems like it's sort of 
um, halfway through. And then he really got hung up on the idea that, you know, business is a competition. This is like an old school dude too. He's a great, yeah, yeah. he was a great editor, but a very 1980s New York uh, mm -hmm. mentality of business, right? So of course it's a fight. It's a fight against your competitors. Like, no, actually it's not. It's totally different. So we never really saw it that way. And I took the idea and just said, you know what? Uh, before I move on to a different idea for a book, et cetera, let me just explore this. And I decided to write it without a net, right? Right. Just write it myself to see what happens. Yeah. Um, and he was right about some things and he was wrong about others. Uh, the first thing he was right about is it was not fully developed. Uh, when I finished writing it, the book was only 20,000 words, which is not a book. Uh, it's about half of a book. It's actually a really long New Yorker article. That's about all it is. And, um, but then I wanted to do something with it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so my agent and I worked together and we, uh, we sold it to audible. We did an exclusive thing with audible where we recorded as about a two hour audiobook. still one of my favorite projects to work on ever. And we launched it February 28th, 2020. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're in podcasting. You know exactly yeah, yeah. what happened about a month later where everyone's consumption of audio just disappeared until their commutes resumed, yeah, right? right. And, and so the book and they weren't tanked. thinking I about mean, business really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So to yeah. date, we probably only sold a thousand copies of that book. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you'd love to support it, please, it's only like $7, grab a copy. But um, but what it allowed me to do, two things happen, right? Number one, because of the pandemic, that same editor who rejected me and who I took personally and I was annoyed, my idea he called ugly, right? Mm -hmm. yep. you ugly where baby. I got all this, yep. right? Um, he came back to me with the idea for leading from anywhere. We dove into a lot of the team culture research. And when it was, when I was diving into that for what will become my forthcoming book that comes out about a month from now called best team ever. Um, I realized that that's only one element of what makes for a great team purpose. And I now call it pro social purpose, which is actually more, who are we fighting for mm. than what? Um, but it's only one element alongside the psychological safety concept we talked about. And then actually some basics of execution. Do we have clarity and dependability? Do we trust? Do we know each other's strengths and weaknesses and personality differences, et cetera? And, uh, and so he was right. The idea wasn't fully developed. It, it took a detour of writing a whole book about remote and hybrid work and all of that to figure out what was missing. Uh, but I feel like I'm in a much better place for it. I'm way more excited about it now. That's a great story, man. I, and it's, it's, uh, it's so true that with the things I, I, I have no doubt that that's probably that book's going to catch on somehow because that's usually how the world works. Is the thing uh, w once something uh, seems like it's it it's kind of dead in a way, it ha springs to life again. Is often how the world yeah. works. Well, I I'll tell you, it's it's kind of fun to have sort of a cult classic, yeah. right? <laughs> and I don't I don't mean to like compare myself to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but what I mean is like the only people who have listened to that book are people who really love my work. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I can really kind of tell, like, how much of my work and my body of work are you familiar with? As I can tell it based on whether or not you're familiar with that one sort of audio track, right? And it's a great, it was so much fun to write. We've got stories in there about, like, the the men's USA curling team that were all cut and adopted this moniker team reject and use that to fuel their inspiration to actually win a gold medal um, in, in 2018. Like, there's all sorts of really cool stories in that book that we got to tell, but only certain people know about, yeah. right? So. Yeah. Um, so who knows, maybe it will, maybe, maybe writing it was the preparation for writing best team ever. And that'll catch on. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, the so, two big things I learned right are that sometimes it is worthwhile to go out without a net and just try something to figure yeah. out what it is. Yep. Uh, and, and then sometimes the people who criticize your idea are right. And you have to have the humility to admit that and then go, okay, well, how do I build on this? Yeah. How do I make this ugly baby a beautiful toddler? Love it. Love that. Uh, that's called pick a fight, right? Yeah. And then Leading From Anywhere, is that your current book? Leading From Anywhere is the remote yeah. workbook and okay. Best Team Ever is the, the new one specifically on team culture. I, I like to think of it as the sort of culture code for a post-pandemic era, right? When you're not all in person, how do you still build that culture that makes for a high-performing team? Cool. Love it. I have no doubt people are going to want all those books. So um, could you uh, let folks know how to how to find you, how to reach out to you? So I, I'm really, really lucky. Uh, DavidBurgess.com is a really weird name. or Well, <laughs> actually, that would be a really weird name. David Burgess is a really weird name, which meant that .com was still open, nice. right? Which is great. Uh, to date, there's only, even if you just type it into Google, you'll find either me uh, or you'll find a 24-year-old Hungarian filmmaker whose stuff is actually really cool and worth watching. But you'll know it's not me pretty quickly, and then you'll be able to go through. So uh, David Burgess into Google or DavidBurgess.com would be the place to go. Love it, man. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, welcome to the LeaderCast community. We'll find other ways to connect with you, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, learned a lot of great stuff and it was great just to hear your story. So thank you so much. Yeah, I know. Thank you so much for having me.